Okay, so quantum photonics is quantum dots. Um, a tinder, which is what this is advertising. Um, and the basic idea is that we've been working with quantum dots quite a bit before this was called quantum technologies. Um, uh, but the basic idea is, is, is so we'll go through a little bit of what we're doing. Um, obviously, all these results here are the result are being obtained over the years uh, by in the group, and this is the group as it is today on the quantum optics side with quantum dots and the quantum technology side. Um, there's obviously way more people involved <laughs> historically and even now uh, uh, to make this possible. Um, so, okay, so uh, we do quantum dots, but we also do a number of other things. So uh, in principle, in the, in the extent our offer is broader than just uh, quantum dots, it's we, we have a broad activities in terms of on three, five materials from laser you see the mouse? Um, you see it now? Yeah, we can, yeah. Fantastic. So I'm getting used to online presentations, only two years of training. Um, so lasers here, but we do quality materials to check and understand things and understand how step organizes. Then we apply this, for example, to metamorphic buffers, where we, you know, we recently demonstrated first metamorphic laser on Gallium Arsenal, which was Know, above 1.3 microns, um, and uh, so this part works well. Uh, and then obviously quantum dots, and we have the quantum photonic lab where we measure these quantum dots cryogenically, which they work at below 10 Kelvin. Um, so how do we do these dots? We are rather unique. Uh, in, at the moment, we are unique in the world doing them. We were not unique. There were two groups doing this, uh, one in the and one here. Uh, we dig holes in 111. Uh, Gallium arsenide structure, which is an exotic direction, and, and then we fill the holes uh, with the growth. And this is a simple, an example of what we, yeah, you, we grow quantum well, it's ingas quantum well and gallium arsenide barriers, and then we can add other stuff, which is functional, and we'll see why functional uh, to a device, for example. But uh, fundamentally, what happens is that here in the middle, the fast diffusing atoms, indium in this case, will concentrate there more than the gallium. Ones and so we have an indium rich region, uh, which is well, is fundamentally thicker than anywhere else here in that it, there in the middle. You call this capillarity, as other people have done in the past, or you call it there is more bonds there, so that's where you get. Uh, it doesn't matter at the end of the story, uh, there is a higher growth rate in the middle, and that promotes the formation of a thicker layer because it's in three dimensional, thicker layer in three dimensions. Then you get a quantum dot, and then you need to extract light to it. And in the normal, as grown direction, it's not very efficient. Um, there's a lot of internal reflection because of the geometry of the system. So very often we do what is called back hatching, remove the substrate, and we have this thing coming up, as you can see here. Um, or we have more. We can remove the substrate in other way, put a sacrificial layer, and extract the uh, micron-sized pyramids, uh, and then put them on a PDMS or a piece of, of uh, Scotch tape actually can do does the job, and then you can get them useful for something else. Okay. What's peculiar of these is that because of the process, they are site control. So uh, at this stage, site control is good if you want to make integration because at least you know where they are. Doesn't solve all the problems, but it makes your life easier. Um, and this is why they're interesting and they've been interesting historically. Uh, there's more stuff happening when you grow. If you just grow ingas, you, as here on the right, you grow a quantum dot, and then you have uh, actually we group quantum wires uh, mm -hmm. for those who are in another generation and know what I'm referring to, stuff which was developed in the late 80s and have been a uh, highlight for laser V group quantum wires in the 90s. Uh, but these are actually effectively in the same crystallographic direction and they form on the side, they're thinner than the dot. So they're blue shifted, so they don't give a problem with the dot emission. Um, and then if you grow aluminum gallium arsenide, uh, gal aluminum doesn't move much, gallium a lot. So there's all sorts of segregation happening. And the most important one is this vertical quantum wire here, which is sort of 20 nanometer broad, but it's a low aluminum layer. So let's say if you grow a 30% algae there, there will only be 4% of aluminum in there. So it's sort of a wire which you can use, for example, for electrical injection and not just for interesting uh, optical experiments. 
So there's plenty of lot of stuff. Don't want to complicate it too much in a short seminar. But one other thing which is very important is this. In this image, we can stack a lot of dots. These, these, these are thick dots intentionally done for FM imaging and for the publicity of it. But you can put a lot of them and you control them. But they do have a slow evolution in shape, uh, but it doesn't matter. You can control where you put them. This is something that normal self thermal process don't give you, uh, with maybe the exception of uh, the vapor liquid solid uh, nanowires where you put the dot in them, uh, where, but there is also memory effect there, so a bit more complicated for them to control. Coupling between dots than for us. So couple dots are a key issue here. You can couple more, one or two or many of them, as we've done in the past, and they work and you can control them very well. It's also very uniform. I'll come back uh, so that, um, so why it has been historically interesting because I can quantum technology because I can emit entangled photons. I remember when I was you know, younger, unfortunately, early 2000, there will be a lot of people not believing that this would even be possible. Um, and you know, basically, you have these, you have to form a singlet here in your dot, which is a textbook singlet. You put one electron and another electron in the same quantum dot, they go spin up and spin down. Here it's slightly more complicated because you have holes, the lack of an electron, but you still have spin up and spin down for the same rules as first quantum mechanical textbooks. And then, they, well, they're entangled because unless there's something breaking the coherence of the state, some vibration, uh, that's why we work at 10 Kelvin. At room temperature, this doesn't last for very long, not long enough, but with 10 Kelvin it does. And then you can emit, and you can see here on the right, I intentionally draw this as a superposition of spin up and spin down because this is what this formula tells you that your your electron is half spin up and half spin down and not just spin up or spin down. If it doesn't have a reason to choose, if it's spin up or spin down, it doesn't choose. Um, and then because it doesn't choose, you get an entangled state and this entangled state will emit light, which is coherence is preserved, stays entangled. And so this is the graphic. I hope it works. Yeah, I sort of works. So first photon emitted, and then one nanosecond later, you emit another photon, which is half half, and you still get, and these two are entangled within each other in the cascade. This was the first proposal for entanglement, and the state is down here after the light is emitted, and when there is no other symmetry in the system, this is the light, le left, the right, right, left entanglement light. If there is Fine circuit splitting, i.e., it's the two excitonic state, are slightly different in energy, micro Z difference, and this gets a little bit more complicated, but okay, uh, still entangled, just more complicated, a, a version of entanglement which is a little bit more complicated. So we, we've done this electrically and we published, uh, we were something like the third, fourth group in the world to get this result in 2013, certainly the first one with site control. Um, and then we went, like, can we do a device to do it? And we did this, it took some years. So this is the structure or the schematic of the device that has been, so it's a conventional PIN structure with the dot in the middle. This was an Inga sample in gallium arsenide and barrier. And the important aspect here is, let me go back, sorry guys, is that we had to win one big problem, which is current will turn, you see, this is a three dimensional structure, so current doesn't like to go through vertical and populate the dot, but in normal condition, it simply goes lateral from the side and you just don't get entangled light from your dot. And I'll discuss how we fix this, but we did fix this. And this is pulse measurement and you can get entangled photons done with the conventional correlations uh, where you look in which basis uh, the photons go through your filters. If uh, there's two photons, so you look if they're both right, right polarized, or both right, left. Um, I won't spend too much time on how exactly this, uh, how this allows to distinguish between classical light and entangled light, but it's sort of straightforward once you spend a little bit of time on that. And, and when everything is ideal, six measurements are enough. If you want to do a full tomography, it's way more. But anyway, we demonstrated entanglement and also uh, something which I guess is very important, violation of Bell inequalities. So you can have entanglement, but still not violate Bell inequalities, which is more important in terms of demonstrating that this is a non-classical state and that this is the result of a coherent field behavior. Okay, so uh, that works even electrically pumped. So the quality 
the entanglement is actually very high. So we are very happy of that. And also in nature photonics, they were. And, and they liked the shape of the pyramid. So we got this. This was 2016, I think. Um, so or, I'm afraid a few years ago. Um, but we got, uh, they got visibility uh, because of the quality of our results. And we're very, and again, not many groups in the world, just a few groups in the world have demonstrated electrically pumped entanglement. Okay, uh, they said they would discuss how we got through there. And this is, and I'd um, like to discuss this because this goes beyond the single quantum dot, but the idea that you have, if you, for example, have algas, you have this vertical quantum wire, and this vertical quantum wire can act as a wire to inject in a selective way, electrons and holes into the dot, which is exactly what has happened here. So the structure of the sample was quite rather complicated with algas layer to inject and actually algas layer with high concentration here as barriers to prevent lateral transmission of current. Uh, but because there is segregation, then the barrier here to inject into the LED in the dot is much smaller. And so at the end, when you turn on your, your electric field, well, electrons will try to go through the, where the barrier, the path is less problematic, which is the one injecting into the dot. And that is why this whole thing works. So very we are very, I'm very proud that this engineering concept went in and allowed us to demonstrate the dot quality. And you can see that we contacted them all and they all turn on. Uh, there's a high voltage there, much higher than it should be. Uh, and, but we'll, and what we see here is the light of the lateral wires actually emitting because it's intense enough to, to be collected by the CCD while the single photon isn't. But the single photon is where when you, when you polarize the lower voltage, you get just the single photon, the well, entangled photons, but the single photon detection. Uh, you can evolve this. Um, you can work on a different system where the dot is, for example, gallium arsenide um, in algas barriers instead of ingas in gallium arsenide. And there are a number of reasons to try to move away from the ingas uh, system um, for more complex um, uh, entanglement emission like cluster state where the entanglement is within repetition of your excitation and not just in one cycle of excitation, which is what we've been doing in that 2016 work. Um, uh, not again entering, but you see that you can do good quality gallium arsenide algas with the two photon resonance. On the left, you see accident by accident and not much else. Excited, and you can see here on the right, Rabi oscillation is a function of power, um, which was uh, possible. And so that shows this coherence is preserved. There's a decay, obviously, of the intensity because uh, things happen uh, when you pump hard. But nevertheless, that shows you that the dots are very good. Um, you can process them in many different ways. Um, and this is, I think, is important when you think about integrating them, uh, because when you have where do you put them? You need to have a versatility in the way you process this so that the dot is available to match your cavity, to match your waveguide, to match your trip at the end, which will, uh, uh, so you, your dot is your source of light, but then your source of light has to go into something which makes it, um, op uh, it can operate with, and you can operate uh, to change it and make a quantum processing and not just entangle the mission. Uh, and so you can make pillars, for example, by using the hole that we leave after uh, after growth and fill it with silicon nitride, a little bit of polishing, and then that can act as a silicon oxide, sorry, that can act as a mask. Uh, we can do alternative ways to act as a mask. Or you can simply polish the sample down to become a flat surface and not a three-dimensional surface, which, you know, has prob problematic, or as I said, gives problems as 3D is more difficult to handle than a flat thing and then release the whole thing, for example. Or you can simply do what I told you like that with Captain tape or PDMS or Scotch tape, whatever. If a captain is quite good in the crisis, so that's fine. Um, and that allows them to do uh, things which, for example, put in this stuff on a piezo and try to tune uh, the state. Uh, with, this is what a sense project is about. Um, and um, we started already, there's unprivileged to solve to make this successful, but we're working on it. Um, and, and then in general, the, the aim is that to go towards integration and just make publicity of a recent paper, which is a review paper uh, or a 
perspective paper, to be more correct, in Nature Review Physics on the potential for integrated photonics, uh, because integrated photonics is important for quantum technology. Um, there's a bunch of people there, um, but the basic idea is that we need to develop something which is hetero, which has, you know, you can't think about a single silicon photonic platform for quantum. It has to be a, more complex than that uh, to accommodate the detectors, the sources, uh, even the uh, MEM structure, for example, to process, uh, to reconfigure quickly and process light for fast feed forward, for example. Now, so all that is complicated. It's not grab all in this picture, but there's a lot in this picture. Um, and in general, obviously, we can start from complicated, which is a full integrated thing, or can even uh, make it more simple. We can try to couple the dog mechan, you know, by butt coupling, um, by just putting a chip uh, nearby in a cryostat, which is what is difficult to do. Uh, and then, and then the chip is called the dot is called. And we couple and do uh, and do um, and demonstrate that you can process light through the chip, which is one of the current projects we have in our group. Um, but obviously, we we are open with many more than just that. Um, okay, so I maybe I rushed a bit. Um, be able to or maybe I was too slow. I don't know, but I think I've sort of covered my 15 minutes. So uh, welcome for any questions. Thanks, Emanuele. Yeah, we'll leave the questions for the Q&A at the end. So uh, thanks again. And we could okay, move to... I'll stop sharing then. Um, yeah, we'll I hope I'm on to... time. I'm not sure if I am. You're fine. You're fine. Don't worry. Uh, we'll move on to Gerard. So. OK. Uh, OK, thank you. Nicholas, yeah, uh, take a chair, share my screen. Yeah, we can. You 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 can see. Yeah, we can see. Yeah. Okay. So. Although you're still on 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 PowerPoint, you're not on presentation. Oh yeah, sorry, you're doing it. You see it? Okay, fine. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Gerard Gibodo, and then we'll uh, present this talk about the electrical characterization and uh, the SOI devices for, for quantum computing. Sorry. For me, it's Gibaldo. Yes, <laughs> give out in Italian and <laughs> borrow in French, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so I will present, by the way, this uh, this uh, speech on uh, quantum computing, uh, Creo CMOS without electronics, with my colleague uh, Francesco Serra di Santa Maria, uh, Italian name as well, as you can see. So we are working both in uh, IMAP Black Laboratory, uh, CNRS in Minatech Center. So this talk, of course, is in the context of uh, quantum computing, uh, where you have a strong need in uh, Sarah, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, yes. Can you put it on full screen? Uh, have you put it on full screen or not? Yes, I am in full screen. Ah, we can only see the oh. present. Could you switch the screen? So yeah, we're only seeing the PowerPoint. When you share your screen, when you share your screen, yeah. share your, your whole screen, not only the, the PowerPoint. There are all the way yeah. down where there is the magnification bar, just the, the icon next to 86. If you click that, you go full screen. All the way down uh, bottom. OK, uh, let, me, let me see if I can do it. Uh, no, not yet. No, go, go in the bottom right corner, please. Bottom right corner. Yeah. Next to 86. I don't see this. I, okay. Anyway. No, no. I think it has to do with the with the sharing of the screen. Yes, um, probably. Let's make. Uh, uh, stop. Stop sharing your screen. I stop and, sharing. Yes, yeah. and then share it again, but the whole screen, not only the program. The screen. This one. Yes, probably this one. Is it better now? Yes, I think this will work. Let's check. Uh, I put full screen. Is it yes. okay? Okay. Good. Thank you, Zara. Okay, so it, just telling that uh, we are working in IMAP uh, CNRS in Minatech Center. So uh, actually, this talk is uh, goes uh, in the context of the quantum computing, where actually in a typical cryostat, uh, where you, you have the quantum, uh, the qubit state, which is located here, very, very low temperature, typically in the mid-k range, 
we are dealing with uh, a lot of electronics, which is on top of it, of course, which is typically ranging temperature in between one Kelvin and 7070 and going up to room temperature. And therefore, the readout electronics we, we need to read, of course, the qubit devices is situated right here, okay, in different uh, uh, circuits are uh, needed. For example, the different RF or, uh, uh, converters, AC uh, circuits are to be designed typically in CMOS, uh, 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 CMOS microelectronics. And that's, that's why we have a strong need in uh, new characterization and modeling tools to, uh, let's say, to apply this methodology to uh, modern CMOS devices. This story has been studied for CMOS at very low temperature electronics already 30 years ago, but now we have to, have to, have to update all this characterization and modeling tools to CMOS devices with actual generation, for example, FDS-5, FinFETs, and probably the next generation will be nanoribbons, nanowire, but operated at deep cryogenic temperature that is typically down to one Kelvin or in this liquid helium temperature range. Uh, in our lab, we're doing this on a low temperature platform, which is uh, shown over here typically, uh, which is a 200 millimeter wafer for, for example, size. Uh, we can go down to typically close to liquid ion temperature up to room temperature and analyzing this type of wafer size. We have also DC probe as an RF probe, and or we have also cryostat where we can analyze package devices. And we can, of course, in this. Uh, uh, platform characterized the uh, different uh, IV capacitance and also also the low frequency noise characteristic of such uh, devices. So let's go first the first the property of field effect devices, which is what we call the inversion charge control law. In this case, what we, we need to characterize is the inversion charge, that is the charge of the electron you could form in the channel of, of the field effect transistor, field effect uh, devices. In this case, the field effect device we are characterizing are typically the so-called FDSOI uh, 20 uh, nanometer, 28 nanometer technology uh, provided by ST microelectronics, where we have basically a seven nanometer uh, thin silicon layer, which is somewhere here, and uh, which is sandwiched in between a box oxide, uh, 20 nan 25 nanometer thick, and a very thin oxide, a gate oxide of around one nanometer uh, of thickness, which is on top of it here, which is typically a high cade electric, by the way. And uh, in this device, we're me measuring the vertical properties, that is the, the charge we can use when we put a gate voltage here on the gate, what we can use in the channel of such devices. To do that, we, we are measuring typically what we call the gate to channel capacitance. So for that, we use a typical impedance analyzer and we measure the the, the imaginary part of the impedance between the gate and the channel. And we are measuring directly out of that the gate to channel capacitance, the capacitance therefore of, the, of view from the gate, and which is related in terms of a small signal analysis to the derivative of the inversion charge or the charge we have in the channel, with respect to the, the variation of the gate voltage we apply, the AC voltage we apply in the gate. So you have typical characteristics which are shown here for NMOS and for PMOS devices of this gate to channel capacitance, which have been measured on a larger reality base device in order, to, of course, to make the measurement feasible. And you have typical characteristics which have been measured from room temperature down to four Kelvin right here. What you see is that a strong inversion that is typically above the threshold, which is this turn on region over here for both NMOS and PMOS, the capacitance go to a constant, which is typically the gate oxide capacitance, that is the, the, the oxide, the, the front gate electric, the electric of the, of the front gate. And therefore, you have a change of the little bit of the slope or the switching behavior of this capacitance when you go to low temperature, the, the, the slope becomes steeper, as you can see here. An interesting feature when you go to FDSOI is that you have, you can induce a, a change in the VT that is the transition you have here can be changed very significantly by tuning the back gate uh, bias you can apply, the back gate bias you can apply on the substrate uh, here on the FDSOI structure. This is a specificity of the FDSOI and by this way you can reduce uh, the value as small as you want of the gate voltage here and uh, making possible the application of such devices for low voltage and low power uh, application. So once we have this inversion charge capacitance measured on large area devices, in this case, between 
very low temperature up to room temperature, you have the characteristic over here, you make the integration of this curve by this way over here, and therefore you obtain, you reconstruct the inversion charge, uh, inversion law of these devices, that is the inversion charge versus the gate voltage. You can plot in log scale or in linear scale, for example, here, and inversion charge go linearly as you are over the threshold voltage with the, with the gate voltage, typically as C ox VG minus VT, this VT being the threshold voltage, of course, of the, of the, of the transistor over here. And this is for whatever the temperature in between 4K and, and room temperature. Once you have this uh, inversion charge available, now you, we have a specific methodology to extract the parameter of the, the MOSFET over here. For that, we, we take the inversion charge, we divide it by the capacitance we have measured before, the gate, the gate to channel capacitance, and we plot it versus the inversion charge of, of this plot over here. And what we see, which is very interesting, is that when you plot it, whatever the temperature you have, which is all the curve, the red curve, and for different temperature, which are shown here, you obtain a single straight line, okay? Which means that this equation over here applies for the inversion charge over the capacitance versus the inversion charge. And this is actually a differential equation because this is a derivative, uh, which means in this case that this function, which is the, the lambda W function, applies to describe your inversion charge versus the gate voltage. And this is the demonstrated in more detail here when you plot this charge, normalize the capacitance versus the inversion charge in glow scale over here. And then we apply this methodology when you have this uh, inversion charge versus the gate voltage to fit all your curve you have, the inversion charge versus the gate voltage in linear scale or low scale or the capacitance itself as a function of the gate voltage, you can apply it uh, for different temperature and you have only three feeding parameters remaining when you use this lambda w function which can be taken with an approximative uh, analytical form very easily this uh, uh, lambda function can be used to feed all the inversion charge versus the, the gate voltage the bias you apply on the gate and versus different temperature for that you have the gate oxide capacitance which is an amplitude parameter which fix up the, the value of the capacitance strong inversion you have an ideality factor N, which fix up the slope here you have in sub threshold regime over here. And you have, of course, a threshold voltage, which uh, give you the, 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 the direction where the diversion shot uh, turn on linearly with the, the gate voltage. So this is very interesting. It can be applied after to, to go to the drain current transfer characteristics. And now I give, I give the talk to my colleague, uh, uh, Francesco. Please, Francesco, you can continue on the next slide. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for, for the intro. So jumping right in, as we go down to lower temperature and uh, we measure the drain current that goes through the MOSFET, we can right away see the two main behavior that happen that take place at a low temperature. The first one, uh, if you take a look at the picture on the left, is how the subthreshold slope of the drain current is uh, increasing for lower temperature. And uh, as well, uh, we see that uh, the drain current uh, for high gate voltages is maximizing. Uh, and this is due on, for the first case to, uh, to the Boltzmann statistic, which uh, makes sure that less electrons are uh, promoted for the same uh, gate voltage in the conduction band. And, and this gives a faster turn on. Uh, sharper turn on, and on the other hand, the reduction in uh, vibration in the uh, in the in the lattice of uh, vibra vibrational energy at low temperature increases the 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 drain current for low temperatures. Uh, as you can see here on the in the picture on the on the right, we have the plot of the subthreshold swing, which is going down to lower temperature uh, decreases till a settling value of about 10 millikelvin which is an experimental limit that uh, we have uh, well seen in literature. Okay, so, okay. Uh, here you can see how we have uh, compared our experimental results with uh, Lambert uh, analysis for a big geometry device, namely uh, 10 micron by 10 micron on the, on the, uh, on the gate area. And uh, you can see that we have um, uh, reasonably managed to have uh, a proper fitting throughout the uh, all temperature range of both uh, drain, of, uh, drain current, transconductance, and uh, the Y function, which is uh, 
value that comes from uh, combining the drain current and its own transconductance so to get rid of uh, any effect of access resistance. Uh, as we can, uh, if we take another look, we see still the, the effects that I've said before, uh, which, which are the sharpening of the, of the drain current slope in the subthreshold region and the increase in, uh, in the, increase on the, of the maximum value of the current in the high gate, uh, high gate voltage region. Okay, so uh, when we go to extract the parameters, so uh, a first glance is, uh, is that we have, as a name first, there is the Boltzmann statistic taking place, meaning that less electron for a given, a fixed uh, gate voltage are promoted to the, to the conduction band. This means that our threshold voltage with a lowering temperature shifts forward. And this is how we see that uh, for lower temperature, the threshold voltage is increasing. On the other hand, uh, the ideality factor of the of the transistor, which is a related measure, a related quantity to the subthreshold swing, uh, shows the, the shows the dependence on temperature, and therefore, uh, with a, as we said, as we saw before, as the temperature decreases, the subthreshold swing uh, decreases as well, or in our case, the the, the, the ideality factor increases. Uh, for what concerns the mobility, as we said. Uh, the reduction in phonon scattering uh, causes uh, an increase in the maximum mobility value in the transistor at lower temperature. And uh, here is what we see. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, now, as of course, uh, the transistor that we have to use in quantum technology are supposed to be a very small size. Uh, we have compared our lumbar fitting with uh, smaller geometries, uh, which are for channel lengths that go down to 30 nanometers. Uh, you can see on the right the 300 uh, Kelvin comparison, and on the left, and on the left, uh, sorry, the other way around, and on the left, uh, uh, on, on the right, the 25K, and uh, the lumber modeling still manages to fit uh, reasonably, uh, regardless of the small channel and the low temperature measure the the, car, the cars, and um, it respects so the behaviors that we were the, that we have measured. Uh, if we then go to the Moving on, Gerard. Sorry, uh, thank you. <laughs> so, if we now take a take a look at the extracted parameters, we can see on the first picture, which is the the threshold voltage with respect to the to the gate length, we can see how uh, there is an effect uh, the, the 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 threshold uh, the, the threshold voltage roll off, which is a short channel effect, is more or less non impacted by the by the temp by the temperature lowering. On the other hand. Mobility, as we saw, as a huge increase for uh, in the in the long channels, and a very low increase basically stays the same for low channels. And this is due to the fact that in long channel there is a predominance of phonon scattering, which re is reduced uh, at lower temperature, while uh, uh, short channels are uh, mainly impacted by uh, neutral impurity scattering, which we are gonna see later. Uh, taking a look at the theta one, uh, which is the first att mobility attenuation parameter, we see how uh, regardless of the temperature for low, uh, for shorter channels, we have a uh, higher theta one value. And this means that uh, the access resistance uh, has a higher weight compared to what it has in, uh, in, long, in longer channels. And this is due to the fact that as the, sh as the channel uh, shrinks down, the channel resistance is uh, becoming more comparable to the access resistance. And this is what we see here. Uh, concerning the threshold voltage uh, that we see versus temperature, we see as we, as we as we saw before that uh, the threshold voltage increases for uh, low for lower temperature, and uh, lastly we can see how mobility plotted versus temperature gives us again uh, that idea of how the slope for uh, long channels is very is very high because we have a high increase and, and a high reduction in uh, in phonon scattering while the slopes for short channels is more or, is more or less flat and this is as i said uh, the effect of neutral impurity scattering um, in the end we have uh, replot the lumber feet uh, uh, for mobility versus channel length and uh, and and, uh, and temperature so that uh, we could extract the percent the percentage of uh, neutral impurity scattering uh, both versus uh, channel length and temperature and this is to show you how uh, 
if you look, if you take a look to the to the picture on the on the on the on the on the right, uh, the net, the percent uh, when the, when the channel is uh, reduced, uh, source and uh, source and drain proximity causes that the um, the the imperfection and the and the defects uh, near these two regions are predominating over the channel. And this is why we see that uh, when we plot the percentage versus the temperature, the car for shorter channels is, is all, all the way on top, giving a a, a very high impact of natural uh, impurity defects. Okay. So getting into getting into the noise. Uh, these are some uh, noise measurements that we have uh, taken on FDSOI devices. Uh, on the first picture on the left, you can see uh, how the noise is behaving with respect to frequency. And this uh, linear behavior right here is uh, the so-called one over F uh, spectra, which is um, which is then can be analyzed at uh, sampled here, where you see the more or less the 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 the, the most the most linear part at the at the ten k uh, the 10, at ten hertz frequency, and if we plot it on the in the picture on the right, we can see how uh, how uh, how the noise is behaving with respect to the drain current. What we see is that the noise now is apparently higher for uh, for a lower temperature, and uh, we have to take for this a look at, a close look at the model because this noise is, is depending on both the transconductance and the SBFP. But as we go uh, farther on and uh, we take a look how the actually, Gerardo, can you go move to it? As we take a look how the how the SBFP is uh, is behaving with respect to lower temperatures, we can see that actually it is more or less invariant, particularly for NMOS uh, uh, with respect to temperature. And this gives, uh, makes us understand that the real reason why the noise is increasing so much in FDSOI devices at, at, at low temperature is because actually the transconductance is, ma is maximized, as, as we said before, due to, due to the, the reduction in the phonon scattering. On the other hand, you can see here uh, the, the, the interface, the trap density, which uh, we uh, assume to be pretty valid till uh, till around 10, uh, 10 k, 100k, but uh, the jump that uh, that it shows below 10, uh, below 100k uh, for us is um, is something that gives us gives us doubt, and this for us is a, a topic to further investigate uh, in the future concerning noise behavior in FDSOIs. Okay, so to conclude, we have shown how. FDSIs are actually better performing down to, cry, uh, down to deep cryogenic temperatures. Uh, the gate control is more effective, as we saw that uh, the, 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 switch on, uh, uh, the switch on behavior is steeper. Um, the drain current is, actu is, uh, is actually max maximized for, uh, for uh, deep cryogenic temperature. And uh, concerning the modeling, the modeling work that we have done, uh, we, we have shown how uh, a lamb the Lambert function, which is a charge, uh, a charge simulating uh, model, uh, can respect uh, short channel effects and uh, deep cryogenic temperature effects uh, across uh, down to uh, 4.2 Kelvin and uh, down to very short uh, very short channel lengths. Uh, lastly, as we said, we have done um, a study on uh, on the noise. And uh, the, the, the main values that characterize the, uh, the, impu the, the imperfection uh, due the, the, uh, the imperfection due noise um, are, are unchanging with respect to, to temperature, all except for the, for, the, for, the, for the trap interface density, which, as I said, is a model that needs further study on, uh, from uh, our point of view. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't go too far away in time. And uh, if there are any questions, we will be asked. No, you're fine. Uh, thanks, Gerard. Thanks, Francesco. Yeah. So I think we'll move on to, to Daniel, please. And then, as I said before, we'll have the questions when, when Daniel is finished. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So I will share my slides. I hope you can see them. They're not yet, but. No, can't. 
Ya, ya sé, ya sabes, Daniel. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation to give a <clears throat> presentation about the ongoing research concerning uh, the development of a scalable diamond-based quantum processor. And I want to start on a high level, and then I will go in more detail and to explain what is the idea behind a, a diamond-based uh, quantum device. <clears throat> so I'm with the Fraunhofer IF based in Freiburg, Germany. And I'm the department leader of the department quantum technologies. And we have four groups, uh, quantum materials, quantum information, quantum electronics, and quantum sensing. And IF is um, a large institute with uh, roughly 300 employees and is a leading research institute for, especially for three, five semiconductors and diamond technologies. And at the front of IF, we are developing electronic and optoelectronic devices, which are um, developed in such sense that we can all build integrated circuits and as well as modules based on the <clears throat> three, five compound semiconductors. Um, in the last two years, uh, the Fraunhofer societies have put up, put up some efforts to implement structures <clears throat> within the Fraunhofer Competence Network, network uh, quantum computing, which I, which I showed here with more than 11 institutes which are participating to give researchers a platform from Germany and also for European, for you uh, uh, in Europe, to take part in the development of quantum technologies, especially research groups and also SME startups and large industry should get the, <clears throat> the opportunity to use and to participate in this development. <clears throat> Additionally, uh, in this competence center, we of course we try to protect the IP and also assess where we have to do further investments. And more specifically, uh, the state Baden Württemberg. Uh, founded a competence center for quantum computing where we have several projects running. And importantly, we have the IBM quantum computer, uh, uh, which is based in, uh, uh, near Stutt Stuttgart, which we can assess and where we can implement first quantum algorithms, especially together with industrial partners. <clears throat> My department are mainly involved in the design and development <clears throat> of a a quantum processor and especially <clears throat> a quantum memory, which I will uh, address later. So what, what are you doing? So we are using here diamond as space material and especially inside a diamond material, we can generate uh, color centers and we have a broad experience how we grow, how we grow such diamonds and how we can generate such NV centers or other color centers. And the color center is mainly a uh, <clears throat> substitutional nitrogen atom sitting on the lattice side, uh, surrounded uh, by uh, um, carbon atoms and one uh, void, which is the vacancy. And this can facilitate it to use as a, a spin-based qubit. And furthermore, if you can see on the left-hand side there, if you adjust the uh, C13 concentration within the diamond uh, material, you can assess those nuclear spins and use them additionally as um, qubits. And this is a different topology if we look to superconducting devices. We will have more uh, uh, a central spin, which is surrounded by qubits. And therefore, we think this <clears throat> can help to improve further uh, the implementation of complex algorithms. Within the competence networks, <clears throat> as I said, we want to develop a hardware platform based on spin-based qubits where we address the hardware and also this uh, software stack. And interestingly, we are now in a cooperation with the German Austrian startup, Quantum Prions, which will use those technology to uh, develop uh, quantum computing or quantum accelerators, which can be then used in high performance computing centers. <clears throat> Within the um, competence, of, competence center Baden-Württemberg, uh, quantum computing Baden-Württemberg, 
uh, we have <clears throat> several partners which are involved. On the quantum application side, we have the Fraunhofer Institute ICT, the University of Constance. For the quantum hardware, we have the KIT in, based in Karlsruhe. Uh, we have the University of Ulm and the University of Stuttgart. For them, for them who are familiar with uh, diamond-based technology, women in Stuttgart uh, have a great expertise in how to facilitate and how to use and grow um, <clears throat> diamonds and how to um, address the color centers in the sense of qubits. And another part is the quantum software because you have to, you have to build up the hardware and also you have to understand the hardware and how to transpile and to map a quantum algorithm, which is written in, uh, which are designed in software suites like Python and uh, the Qiskit um, package, uh, how we can transpile those um, algorithms efficiently and effective to the hardware. So our goal is uh, to build up a spin-based quantum computing system uh, with a maximized connectivity, as you can see on the lower left-hand side, with a high two qubit gate fidelity with up to 99.9%. .9%. And what we are doing right now is to benchmark those spin-based quantum computing system with the IBM Q system in Stuttgart. <clears throat> If you look closely on the left side, you see the, the green uh, arrow is the electron spin, uh, which is generated by the color sender and then surrounded by the C13 nuclear spins. And we see this as a, um, the main part of such a system. So we have one knot which can be addressed by laser pulses and microwave and RF uh, pulses to implement the algorithms and also the, um, um, also the set and the readout schemes. And what we, do in the now, what we are doing now further is to put such a node in a resonator, which gives us then the capability to connect such resonators among each other. And this will pave us the way to show that we can have a scalable device, <clears throat> which have um, great, uh, um, 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 key matrices like two qubit fidelities, three, three qubit fidelities, <clears throat> and uh, the, um, to give the way or to pave the way, as I said it before, for a scalable device. <clears throat> what is shown in the literature? So we um, shown that we can use such a system to implement a 10 qubit quantum register, which is fully connected, then have high one qubit and two qubit gate fidelities. We can have a high initialization and readout fidelity up to 99.9%. 99 .9%. We can implement a five qubit error correction, which is was done or which is what we are doing now uh, within the quantum, uh, competence in the quantum computing Baden-Württemberg. And what we show later in the next one and a half years is that we can have a strong coupling between those cavities, uh, which I said here is um, the, the north, and also show that we can use further um, uh, nuclear spins, which are not in close proximity to the uh, color center, to use them as a nuclear spin quantum memory. So what is the NV center or the color center in a nutshell? So we have here the diamond matrix and with one uh, color center inside. And uh, the color center is, uh, what we are using is the NY minus, um, NY minus uh, color center, which is negative, has one additional negative uh, electron. Uh, one additional electron is negative charged. And we can see here uh, the atomic uh, energy level. And we addressing the, Singlet, uh, the triplet states, uh, uh, mainly the, or we address the, um, <clears throat> the crown state, we initialize with a green laser pulse. And interestingly, in this setup or in this setting, uh, we can initialize to 99.9% .9 the crown state in the MS0 state. So we use the state selective inter system crossing, which you can see via the singlet state, and can polarize, spin polarize the NV center. If we apply uh, a microwave with 
uh, with a frequency around 7.87 gigahertz, we can um, change the spin states in the ground state. And with that, if you use this and you say you generate or to excite in the, the ground state to ms plus minus one, and then uh, pulse with a green laser, you will see a reduction in the fluorescence, uh, which you can see in the left lower part. So we <clears throat> have then this, the, the possibility to um, have an optical um, initialization process and additionally an optical readout process. And <clears throat> what you can see on the right-hand side is the optical detected magnetic resonance. If you put such an NV center into a magnetic field, due to the Siemens effect, the ground levels MS plus one and minus one will split up and you will detect them in the fluorescent spectrum. <clears throat> how we do, how do we generate such um, diamond layers? So our core expertise at the IEF is the growth of such diamond layers. Therefore, we use microwave-assisted plasma-enhanced CVD growth with our uh, in-house developed ellipsoidal uh, reactors. So we couple in from the top side the microwave. From the downside, we couple uh, we bring in the precursors to grow under stable growth conditions, clean and precise uh, grown diamond layers. We have additional the options to dope them. We can dope them with, of course, with nitrogen. We can dope them with boron. We can dope them with phosphorus. <clears throat> and we have a defined growth direction and also height. Here you can see that we can grow very thin layers. So this is uh, on the left side, we have done SIMS measurements and we uh, used uh, isotopical controlled growth to um, measure, to identify in the SIMS measurement our doped layers. And you can see that we can reach with such a growth technique, uh, thin layers um, in the range of 20 nanometers, <clears throat> which then will be used later on to use them in photonic structures. Interestingly, we also address the growth of one-on-one -on -one, um, um, layers, because if you look at the 100 uh, growth, there you can have in the, in the diamond uh, matrix, you can have four direction of the NV center. Um, if, we, if we switch to one-on-one -on -one growth, then we can neglect two of these directions so that just the preferential growth of the NV layers, uh, NV, um, um, centers are directed in the uh, one on one direction, plus minus direction. And so we can switch off one of the one of the, uh, two of the four uh, directions, and we can enhance, therefore, um, the fluorescence, which we can see later in our measurements. <clears throat> what we have done so far so we can grow. Um, diamond layers with and generate inside the color centers. Um, this is done, was done um, that we adjusted and developed um, the suit, suitable growth parameters in isotope pure or in that case isotope, isotope controlled growth. Uh, then we can initialize them with the laser pulses and can modify the states of uh, the ground states um, with, um, with microwave pulses and can reach in our first setup a fidelity of the initialization process of roughly 90%. <clears throat> if we look further and, and say, okay, how we can, uh, how does it look like if we address the surrounding nuclear spins, we compared our device against the IBM Q system one with a, a layout uh, with a com uh, with a con computing chip layout Keto, which has five uh, qubits. In our case, in this case, we have a room temperature setup. Uh, we have three uh, three qubits, which we analyzed, and the three qubits are based off the nitrogen atom and two surrounding carbon 
13 atoms, uh, nuclear spins. As you can see, we are a little bit off concerning the one qubit gates. So we are two, um, two orders away what we can achieve on an IBM quantum system, a Q system one system. But if you look closely to the um, two qubit gates, uh, where we have done a connectivity benchmark uh, using C0 gates, we are really close to the performance of an IBM system. And we have to, you have to keep in mind this is at room temperature and not at millikelvin temperatures, as in the case for the I, uh, IBM system. <clears throat> we are now increasing the uh, number of qubits or at rest nuclear spins. And we want to show by the end of the year that we can use uh, five to 10 nuclear spins and use them um, as, um, as a first demonstrator um, um, to, um, as a first demonstrator, as a, uh, as a first spin-based quantum computer demonstrator, which then will be accessible via web interface, which we can then provide to our uh, partners and to the industry to um, see how this specific uh, topology, topology of this arrangement, arrangements and uh, of the qubits among each other compared to the arrangements which we can see on the left side on the IBM system. Um, to give you uh, within the scope of the SN plus, um, the IF has a very broad expertise in material, in material development uh, concerning diamond growth, diamond processing, and characterizations. We can tailor specific proper, uh, properties of diamond layers concerning the nitrogen data doping. The isotope controlled growth, uh, we can uh, have co-doping with boron or phosphorus, and we can also achieve local growth. This means we can use <clears throat> a intrinsic diamond layer and grow in specific parts of the diamond uh, substrate uh, doped regions, which then can be used further in the integration within uh, a photonic integrated circuits. So could, you can see here our first approach is, this is a, a PL measurement of a photonic, um, photonic structures um, fabricated on diamond. And if we zoom closer, you can see uh, waveguide structures with, um, you can say you can see waveguide structures and you can see resonator structures and the light, you can see the bright parts. This is the part where we have just sitting the NB sinners, which are emitting the PL fluorescence. <clears throat> Additionally, which is very interesting, uh, we can, can uh, this um, manufacturer freestanding uh, diamond photonic structures on diamond to decouple the active regions with the color centers from the substrate, substrate underneath. As a next step, we want to design uh, diamond uh, microchiplets and want to transfer them um, to a PIC device to have a higher level integration um, in a higher hybrid integration to address those um, photonic devices with a PIC chip and to show there that we can achieve a scalable system. And this will be the main research uh, directions for the upcoming two years within the um, Fraunhofer IF, but also in the Competence Center Quantum Computing uh, Baden-Württemberg, but Furthermore, in the whole form of society, uh, quantum, component, uh, quantum computing um, network. So uh, we are ready and open for further cooperation. And <clears throat> uh, to emphasize, you can reach out to us, um, especially for the photonic integrated uh, integration, uh, the PIC integration. And we are happy to work with you in the future. Thanks very much, Daniel. That was, I think that was very interesting. And uh, so I think uh, it's already an hour, so I think I would move uh, straight into the questions and answers. So if you have any questions for any of the speakers, please turn on your microphone and your camera and ask the question now, please. OK. 
Okay. Well, well, we're waiting for some. Uh, even if you don't have a question in this very moment, if you can think of anything, you have my contact details from the registration. So please send me the, if you have any questions, send it to me by email and I'll, oh, we have Pihar, yeah, could you Hello. please, yeah. Hello, thanks very much for the calls. Gerard uh, Gibudov, yes, I have a quick question. I saw in one of the curves that you have a kink in the measurements results, I think for wall temperature. Is this, did I see correctly or not? Uh, because the, the subthreshold hope had some kind of small blood blip of the measure. Oh, yes, okay. so when you measure the in wall temperature, like 50K, do you see some kind of Yes, Hump or kink on the subtraction. Yes, 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 I see. We, this was for short channel devices actually, and uh, this is not observable in, in a long channel case. We we believe that it's some kind of parasitic channel we have in short channel devices, especially especially visible in for short channel devices in subtraction region. That's right. Yes, well, 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 some kind of defects, you know, some. Uh, non-ideal behavior in the case of short channel devices. But overall, the, the behavior is the same. It is a better sub-threshold slope when we go to low temperature, even for short channel devices. Okay. So you think it's basic parasitics, not physics, physics doesn't. No, no, yeah. it's, it's technology related, some kind of uh, defects. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, I, I will also, well, again, while waiting, oh, there's a one. Oh, I just wanted to remind people, yeah, uh, the Ascent program is, is here to offer access to infrastructure and technologies. So please go to our website. There we have a whole list of all the technologies and equipment available. So if you have, if, if your research can benefit from accessing any of those, please contact us. Submit an inquiry online and we'll try to, to help you. That's what Ascent is here for. So listen, if we have nothing else, as I said earlier, uh, send me send, send any questions by email and I'll pass them to the speakers. Uh, thanks again to everybody, mostly to the speakers, but also obviously to the attendees. Uh, the webinar has been recorded, so uh, we're hoping to have the recording uploaded to the website in the next couple of days. So if you want to watch it again or if you have some colleague that you think could be benefit from looking at it, it will be available to watch. So thanks again uh, for okay. your time and hope to see you soon in another of these Ascent Plus webinars. Thank Take you, care. Guys. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.